Welcome to Revive Us Nights. We're glad you're here. Please stand and worship with us. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied. Yeah, 
heard this song this morning, so let's sing it out tonight.
Church, and thank you for joining us for our Revivalist Nights. We're so glad you made tonight a priority. During these evenings, you will be here. Welcome to church. We are glad that you're here. Hey, welcome, y'all. We're glad that you're here, for real. And we are excited to hear from Pastor Keegan tonight. And uh, I cannot wait to, for you all to hear, and for myself to hear, what the Lord has placed on his heart. Uh, before Pastor Keegan comes, we do want to pass the plates. Um, and uh, during these Revivist Nights, all the money, unless you mark on their tithe or something special else, on there, all the money in the plates will go straight to summer camp. We're trying to get as many of our kids and teens to summer camp as possible. So if everybody pitches in, pitches in a few bucks uh, over the next four nights, uh, maybe we can get two or three kids to camp, and uh, and that would be a huge blessing. Uh, we'll have our revivist nights. Obviously, we've begun tonight, the next two Wednesday nights, and next Sunday nights. Wednesday night will be at 6:30 here uh, in our worship center, and we're excited for that. Uh, anything else I'm supposed to announce? I don't, I don't even know what's happening. It's all in the video. Is that good? We feel like that's good? Anybody else know anything else coming up? Easter's coming up? Yeah. Yeah, I said that. Yep. Wednesday nights. Yep. 630. Um, <laughs> yep. All right. Cover it all there. Good. Ushers, would you go ahead and come and would you pass those plates? And uh, I just want to remind you all. Um, of Pastor Keegan's calling. Uh, it has been about two, three and a half years ago that Pastor Keegan walked in off the street on a Sunday morning. And I noticed him here, and uh, being a young person, he did not fill out a card. Uh, and uh, just throwing you under the bus there. But he started coming more regularly, and I got to know him, and we went out to breakfast, uh, or brunch, or brunch, lunch, something like that, and he told me that he was a Treveca student uh, that had moved this direction, that in order to save a few bucks, after he served four years in the Marine Corps, that he bought a travel trailer, and knew of a friend of a friend of a friend's aunt's mother's second cousin's second re re removed, is that what you say, in the South? Um, his wife's mom, who owned some land out in Bethpage area and was letting him live there, and he was commuting the hour into Trevecca to finish his undergrad and to become a pastor. Uh, the, uh, the, the Sunday before or the Sunday after Keegan first came, our youth director at the time had stepped down, uh, and things just seemed of God, and Keegan filled our youth ministry role for a couple years and now he's transitioned into working to plant a community of Christ followers in Springfield. And uh, the work there has begun, and he is a missionary to Springfield, sent from our church uh, uh, by God, and is doing that work. Um, and we'll, we'll, you'll hear more uh, about the ways in which God is at work through uh, what we're calling communities on mission. So getting a group of people together, uh, not just to come and worship, but to serve their community and to worship. And uh, we are so excited about the good work. Keegan loves Springfield, and he feels called to it. On top of that, he is busy working on a master's degree at European Nazarene College. Is that right? Nazarene Theological, uh, which is uh, like a seminary in Manchester, England. He'll travel there uh, several times for like week-long intensives, and uh, just got back in Middle of Jan middle late January from a week long intensive there, and uh, he's a brilliant young man who is hungry to serve the Lord. I just want to point out that no one from this side of the church came back tonight, and I feel very <laughs> uneven right now. Uh, can you put the pulpit like right there tonight, Keegan? <laughs> uh, wait, okay, okay, they just moved over. They just moved over. Okay, all right, we got a couple. Good. Good. Uh, we know where the real Christians sit on Sunday mornings now. Am I right? Am I right? So, good. I want to pray over Keegan and then give him uh, plenty of opportunity to preach the word of the Lord. Jesus, we thank you so much 
for the time that you've given us here tonight, Lord, to hear from one of your choice servants, Keegan Reckinger. We ask, Father, that you would anoint the words of his mouth, Lord. May your thoughts become his thoughts. May your voice become his voice tonight, Father, as he preaches the word to each of us. Lord, would you make our hearts open to receive what it is that he has prepared. Father, may we rest well tonight. But Lord, may we not leave here the same in which we entered here. May we leave changed and convicted to be more faithful followers of yours. And in doing so, Lord, we'll give you all the praise and glory and honors. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray all these things. And together we said, amen. amen. Break a leg, Keegan. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Jeez. The question about these things is, when do you want to go, right? Because we have four of them. Do you want to be the opener? Do you want to be the closer? Or do you want to fall somewhere in the middle where nobody's going to remember you? And I think that there's a joke, so you can laugh. I wasn't serious. People will remember Dustin. Uh, so the beginning is interesting because you get to set the tone for the rest of it. So if you're bad, everybody's going to perceive everybody else as bad. But if you close, that's what people are going to remember the most. So have fun. Closing. I'm going to open. When we say revival... We're saying something is dead something, or dying. Something has to be dead or dying to be revived. But I want to ask this church, is that why we're here? When I look out at Portland Nazarene, I don't see a dead church. I actually see a church that for the last three and a half years of me being here has undergone great, beautiful transformation to become something new of a new substance while retaining old DNA. And the work that Portland has done, Portland Nazarene, has done in Portland has, has been work of new creation. There's no doubt. So from the jump, I want to be clear. I don't think that this congregation is dead. But something is dead. So I want to ask you guys, what is dead? And I, this isn't me asking you to respond to me. This is me just sitting down. So I, I went on a trip recently, and I was in uh, a place where I've been before, but it wasn't necessarily what I would say familiar to me. But to my family that came before me, it certainly would have been familiar. And in this place, there was a river. I like nature. So I sat along the riverbank. And as I sat there on the riverbank... I was visited by God. Would you, would you have it? As God does sometimes. And almost in an instant, it was as if I were transported to a different place. And in my mind, I was taken to a valley. And this valley, it was filled with bones. And the bones were clearly old. They were dry. And while I was sitting there staring, trying to comprehend what I was seeing, God walked up beside me and sat down. And he kind of leaned over and said, do you think these bones can live? And I scoffed, obviously, when God asks you a ridiculous question, you scoff. And, you, and I said to him, you're the only one that knows the answer to that question. You're the only God. God said to me, put his hand on my shoulder, looked at me with a soft smile, clearly entertained. He said to me, prophesy to these bones. Oh, why didn't I think of that? Should have done that when I first got there, right? He said, say this to them. Hear the word of God, bones. Your God says to you, I will cause life to flow into you. And you will live. And I will cause the fibers of your body to bind your bones together and they will be covered in flesh. And you will live. And I will breathe into you life and you will breathe it back out into creation and you will know 
that I am. So, as one does when God tells you to prophesy to bones, I prophesied to bones. And as I was speaking, there was a loud, sudden noise. It was a rattling. And the bones were coming together as I spoke. And when I looked closer, I saw that fibers were binding each bone to its own, and flesh was enveloping over top of them, but they were merely dead carcasses. They had no life. And God elbowed me, and he said, prophesy to the breath of life. Say to it, hear the word of God. Come from all corners of creation, breath of life. Flow into these carcasses that they may live. So as I did before, I prophesied to the breath of life. And the breath of life came and rested on the carcasses, and they lived. And they began to stand in a great multitude. And when they did this, God became solemn. He became very serious. And he looked at me and he said, these are the bones of my whole church. And they cry out to me, oh, our bones are dry. We have no hope. We are completely cut off. He said, therefore, prophesy to them and say, hear God. I will come to your graves, and I will open them and I'll bring you up out of them. Oh, my fractured church, I will reconcile you to my heart, into new creation. And when I come to your graves and I reconcile you from them, I will breathe new life into you and you will live. And you will know that I am has spoken, and I am Acts. Now, there's a lesson of Scripture that runs from the very beginning to the very end, but you won't catch it unless you read from the very beginning to the very end. Don't worry, I'm not going to read from the very beginning. The lesson is, there's nothing new under the sun. Things have been dead before, and God has raised them for purposes far beyond anything that they could have originally been intended for or would have imagined that they were originally intended for. And scripture ebbs and flows with this narrative of God giving life to people and them choosing death instead. There's nobody over there. I was going to look over there. (laughs) But this is the opening narrative of scripture itself. So church, what is dead? What carcasses are lying in front of us that don't have the breath of life that God is asking us to prophesy to? And this is the beauty of Christ's body. This is the point in the sermon where you would expect me to tell you, this is the carcass, it's laying right here. This is what we need to fix. But this is the catch of this sermon. I can't answer that question for you. In fact, there's no pastor that can come up here and answer that question for you or has the right to answer that question for you. The full truth is the body of Christ is diverse, not for the sake of diversity, but that the diverse expressions of death would be revived. And we can't revive all diverse expressions of death if we're a monolith or if there's one person deciding which one needs to be fixed. So what is dead? Do we really want revival? I think we have to answer that question first. Historically, the connotation of revival is very nice. We come together under a tent in our denomination and we sing songs, and we praise, and we might bring friends, and new people might come to Christ, and we may have rebirth. 
But underlying that today is the question, do we really want to admit that we have allowed things we have the ability to revive lie dead in front of us? Or maybe the question further is, have I been the killer myself? May our prayers not beg for revival as, is, as if it's some abstract thing that gets sent down to us and we have no control over and it swoops out and then it leaves without us doing anything. Instead, may our prayers beg for our eyes to be opened to seeing the death that has commanded us to prophesy. That God has said, you have the power to prophesy too. This is true revival. The church itself, and when I say church here, I'm not talking about church congregation. There's a difference between big C and little c church, right? Big C church is what we would call Catholic in theology circles. The Catholic church just means the unified church. Catholic means unity. This is an old term. We changed it in the Apostles' Creed because we didn't like it. But I'm talking about the unified church of Christ, the unified, indivisible body of Christ that we have managed to fracture into so many different unique instances. But our church is indeed fractured. We have across the world generations that can't stand to worship together. We have denominational representatives that can't stand to have a meal with each other or even engage in charitable discourse with each other. Denominations nowadays can't even stand to worship within themselves. When cultures come together, there's groaning. When traditions are tread upon, anger rises to the surface. But when traditions are reinforced, innovators cry oppression. These issues are just a few that plague the church. And they're not unique to the church. Don't think that's what I'm saying either. And there's a reason they're not unique to the church. They all have a common origin. And that common origin is what I want over what is good for the community or what I am comfortable with over what is good for the community or what I like versus what is good for the community. It's I over us. And in search of the insatiable I, because we can never be satisfied, this is the cause of the original sin in Genesis 3, right? we ourselves become the killers of the church. But in Matthew 27, 52, thank God that we have a Christ who has risen for us that in the New Testament reaches back into the Old Testament in Ezekiel and is willing to say to us, the tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Now, if you read this narrative, if you read the crucifixion narrative and the resurrection narrative, it's a very, very weird thing to read. Because it's kind of jammed in there. It doesn't really fit, really at all. You're like, why is that in there? I don't want to know about weird people rising from the dead. But it's reaching back to Ezekiel, and and making good on the promise that God made to raise his people that are dry bones, that are crying out, we have no hope, we're lost, we've been cut off completely, and God is saying, you haven't been. I'm gonna send somebody that can heal you. And we'll go on in scripture to hear that we, the same spirit that is in Christ is the same spirit that is in us. And so thank God, Jesus is a resurrector. God is a resurrector. And through resurrection of ourselves in Christ, because we're already dead, generations will see good in all forms of worship. Denominations will refuse me versus you 
or us versus y'all and acknowledge the only church is the one establishing Christ, Christ's lordship. And that it doesn't matter if you're a Nazarene, it doesn't matter if you're a Methodist, it doesn't matter if you're a Global Methodist or United Methodist or Church of Christer or you're Baptist, you're all in the same church. Oh, a Catholic too, they're also Christians. Cultures will come together instead of obstacles as diverse expressions of community. Traditions will not only be respected, but genuinely evaluated in community for faithfulness to the gospel of Christ in light of modern context. There's nothing wrong with tradition. Tradition is good. It ties us to the saints that came before us. It ties us to identity. But at the same time, they were founded in different times. Church, this is revival. The reconciliation of these things are revival. And that's just a few. I can't tell you all of them because I don't live your lives. That's why there's multiple identities within a community. There are issues at your work that are dead carcasses. There are issues at home that are dead carcasses. There are issues that only you know about in your own life that are dead carcasses. And you don't have to live with them. You don't have to step over them. You don't have to see them every day because Christ has given you the power to speak into them and call the breath of life from all corners of creation to flow into them and give them life. And when you do those things, those carcasses will know who I am is. So I I really only have one question for you tonight. And it's a question that you probably shouldn't answer tonight. You should probably think about more than just tonight. You should take it home. You should sleep on it. You should read scripture on it. You should pray about it. What is dead? Stand and worship with us.
Pastor Keegan, wonderful job. What's dead? We do need to go home and think on that, not be too quick to answer that. You know, as Christians, there are people that think a lot of death. Uh, one of the reasons I love being Wesleyan is because we take the idea of dying well seriously. In fact, we are people who remember death a lot, right? We wear symbols of death around our necks, on our ears. I mean, I don't, but, you know, some people do. Crosses, right? When, when we practice baptism, we practice dying and being resurrected. Have you ever thought about it? When we go backwards, it's like we're going down flat like we will in our grave one day. But and we go under like we will go under one day. And then we come back up, resurrected, to live in the power of Christ. Thank you for that reminder. I want us to take just a few minutes as we close tonight, and I want us to pray over Pastor Keegan. And I want us uh, to pray over him and just to vocally remind him of the love that we have for who he is and who Christ has called him to be. I want us to speak it aloud tonight. We forget sometimes. Keegan has given up everything to follow Jesus. Not a little bit, not a lot, everything. He has moved to a strange place where he knows no one or knew no one and moved into a home by himself as a single man to begin the work of Christ in a community where he and we feel like he is called to be. Everything. Gets paid pennies on the dollar <laughs> to be able to serve Jesus. I'm grateful just to know somebody like that. And tonight, I want us to pray over him. So, Keegan, would you come? Don't go to that altar. Nobody will come. But come up to this one. And church family, would you just gather around? Gather in front. Lay a hand on somebody in front of you. I'm going to ask Pastor Dan to come, and I'm going to ask him to pray over Keegan. He and Keegan have a special relationship. They have walked through school together and have had many a conversation and uh, through that, a special bond has developed. Uh, I'm going to call it a brotherly bond, not a father-son type bond. Uh, 
but a brotherly bond in Christ. And uh, Pastor Dan, would you lead us in an affirming prayer over Pastor Keegan? Our gracious and good God, we thank you for Pastor Keegan. We thank you for the fact that he is sold out for you. That he loves you so much, he's given up literally everything to be in our midst here in Portland and to walk out on faith in the community of Springfield, dear God. He has got a heart that is sold out for you. And it shows in his personal relationships with others. It shows in the way that he reaches out to those that, that really need somebody to see them. And Pastor Keegan sees them. Our world is better because of this young man right here. Your kingdom here on earth is better because of Pastor Keegan. And I just pray that you're with him, dear God, that you lead him where you want him to go, that he hears you and that he follows you. And I pray that as a church here in Portland that has planted him, Springfield, that we never forget him, that we continue to walk alongside him, that we think of new and innovative ways to reach out and encourage him every single day. And we pray for your kingdom work to be done in him and anybody he is around. He is your servant. He is gifted. He's yours. We are honored to have him in our midst. We love him so much, dear God. We pray that he feels your power, your strength, your courage when things get a little tough. We pray that you give him energy right now. He needs it. And we pray most of all for, his, for your presence to be with him every single day, every single hour, every single minute. We ask these things in Jesus' precious, powerful, and holy name. Amen. And before you head back to your seats, stay where, right where you're at. Aaron and his wife, Jamie, have an offer on their house. And next week, they should close. Good Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. It's been a long six months in a two-bedroom house. And they fly out tomorrow to go pack up their home and to get everything moved up here. So if you can we be a little Pentecostal? He said we're all one church tonight. So let's be a little Pentecostal tonight. Would you just reach out a hand? We just reach out a hand as I pray traveling mercies over the Cody's and, uh, and let, let us pray. Father God, tonight we just ask for your continued blessing and mercy on the Cody home, Lord. May they feel your presence with every box that they load, with every piece of furniture that they move, with every piece of clothing that is folded, with everything that they have on this earth is packed away to be moved to Portland, Father. May they feel your grace and your sustaining presence, Lord. And may they be reminded and sustained by you, Father, who give them everything they need. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, be with them, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. If, uh, if this was like when I was growing up, we'd all go to Shoney's afterwards, after Sunday night church. I don't know how y'all did. Dairy Queen, uh, something. But we're glad that you're here tonight. Thanks for being here. Go in the peace of Christ. Sin no more. I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. You're dismissed. Captain D's.